Well, we've been talking a lot about indifference curves and budget constraints and optimality conditions. Now it's time to actually put all of this stuff together to determine how much of goods X1 and X2 you should actually be buying if you want to make an optimal decision. And the answer to this question of what is the optimal outcome is actually really, really simple. We want to buy as much as we can to put us on the highest indifference curve possible, because that gives us the highest amount of utility, within our budget constraint, within what we can afford to actually purchase. So to start off with, let's take a look at that outcome. What we're going to have is just this familiar looking graph where we have X1 and X2. Here's our budget constraint, the downward sloping curve, and remember the slope of the budget constraint. That slope of the budget constraint we said was basically our opportunity cost. It told us the relative prices of the goods that we're looking at. And in this case, what we see is that the slope of the budget constraint is equal to negative P1 over P2. That's the slope of the budget constraint. Now our indifference curves come into play, and they're a little bit different. We have this sort of downward sloping line. We have this indifference curve, we'll call that indifference curve 1. And remember, the slope of the indifference curve tells us the marginal rate of substitution, or it also tells us about uh, changes in how much of each good we're going to buy. So the slope of the indifference curve is the marginal rate of substitution, which is equal to the change in good x2 over the change in good x1. So now we have the two slopes, and we have the two curves. And what we want to do with these two curves is to find out where is the optimal amount of the two goods that we're going to be purchasing. So let's take a look at what we have here. In this case, we're looking at a model. And one of the things about models is you always want to sort of pay attention to where lines cross each other. And here we have a situation where the lines are crossing the budget constraint and the indifference curve. They're crossing in two places. And so we've got a potential outcome here of buying uh, a, a very uh, high amount of X1, X2 and a small amount of X1, or a big amount of X1 and a small amount of X2. We're indifferent between the two, so perhaps it wouldn't matter. If we chose one of those two outcomes, then, hey, great, we've got an optimal decision. But wait, it's not quite that easy. Because if you look at those two things, one of the things you'll notice is that the curves themselves, the budget constraint and the indifference curve, don't have the same slope. Let's just take a look at this point up here. Up here, the indifference curve is steeper. In other words, the marginal rate of substitution, or the change of x2 over the change in x1, is greater than the slope of the budget constraint it's greater than that minus P1 over P2. Down here we have exactly the opposite. Down here we have the marginal rate of substitution, delta X2 over delta X1. It's less than the budget constraint. The budget constraint has a steeper slope at this point than the indifference curve. And what that indicates to us is that there is a trade-off to be made. In this situation up here, what we're looking at is a situation where, again, the slope of the indifference curve is greater than the slope of the budget constraint. What is that telling us? Well, let's put some numbers to it to see if we can figure this out. Let's say that the slope of the indifference curve is 4 over 1. Again, I just sort of made up the numbers, but it's going, going to be steeper than the relative relationship between price. We'll say it's minus 2 over 1. So what is that saying to us? Well, it is saying to us that the market price for this good, for good X1, price P1, relative to P2, is telling us that, hey, you know what? If we compare these two numbers, good 1 is relatively cheaper than good 2 compared to the utility that you're going to receive. And as a result of that, 
you should buy more of good X1 because it's relatively cheaper. This number, in other words, is smaller than this number. It's relatively cheaper compared to the opportunity cost. And so if you buy more of X1, you're going to have to buy less of X2 to stay on the indifference curve. So you might move to this point. And you say, well, wait a second. It's on the same indifference curve. So what? Here's the so what. Look at where that point is relative to your budget constraint. Now you're inside the budget constraint. You can buy more. Why? Well, because X1 is relatively cheaper. And since it's relatively cheaper, you can buy more of this good within your budget constraint, more of good X1, and if you buy less of good X2, that gives you the potential to move to a higher indifference curve. And remember, we said that's a good thing. Now, if we're down at this point, exactly the opposite scenario happens. If down at this point, we have a situation where the relative price is 2 over 1, minus 2 over 1, and let's say that your delta x2 over delta x1 is 1 half, well now the prices, the market determined opportunity costs are greater than this marginal utility uh, relationship or this marginal rate of substitution relationship and you should buy less of good one, and go in this direction, and more of good two. Because the market's telling you it's now relatively more expensive for the happiness that you're getting from it. And again, if that puts you at a point right here, you say, well, well that's still on my same indifference curve, but it's also within your budget constraint. It's inside this budget constraint line. So what is that telling us? Once again, it's telling us this. There's another indifference curve that you can be on, a higher one, one that gives you more happiness, one that gives you greater utility. So let's draw that new indifference curve in. Remember, one of the things we said about indifference curves is that an indifference curve mapping is infinite. It goes on forever. So we can have indifference curves sort of stacked on top of each other. And one of those indifference curves might look something like this. We'll call this indifference curve too. And you'll notice with this indifference curve, that indifference curve just barely touches the budget constraint right here. It never crosses the budget constraint. It only touches the budget constraint at one point, and that's what we're looking for. This point right here is the optimality condition, where we are on an indifference curve that makes us happy, and we are on the budget constraint, so we're spending all of our resources, and how much of each good should we buy? We should buy this amount of X2, we should buy this amount of X1. Because that puts us on the highest possible indifference curve, while still being subject to our budget constraint. Now, if we were to say, well, I want to be on a better indifference curve, I want to be out here somewhere, on this indifference curve, indifference curve 3, we say, well, that would be fabulous, that's wonderful, except you don't have any money or you don't have enough money to get you there. The optimality condition is all about getting on the highest indifference curve that you can attain within the budget constraint. And that's what we see here.